Okay, tonight is the 27th of July. It's the 12th night. We are talking on the Diga Nikaya Suttas. Yesterday we started on Diga Nikaya number 16. So we continue today on page 244. And when the Lord had stayed at Ambapali's grove as long as he wished, he went with a large company of monks to the little village of Baluva where he stayed. Then the Lord said to the monks, You monks should go to anywhere in Vesali where you have friends or acquaintances or supporters and spend the rains there. I shall spend the rains here in Baluva. Very good, Lord, replied the monks. And they did so. But the Lord spent the rains in Baluva. And during the rains, the Lord was attacked by a severe sickness with sharp pains as if he were about to die. But he endured all this mindfully, clearly aware and without complaining. He thought, It is not fitting that I should attain final Nibbana without addressing my followers and taking leave of the Sangha of monks. I must hold this disease in check by energy and and apply myself to the force of life. He did so, and the disease abated. Then the Lord, having recovered from his sickness, as soon as he felt better, went outside and sat on a prepared seat in front of his dwelling. Then the Venerable Ananda came to him, saluted him, sat down to one side and said, Lord, I have seen the Lord in comfort, and I have seen the Lord's patient enduring. And Lord, my body was like a drunkard's. I lost my bearings, and things were unclear to me because of the Lord's sickness. The only thing that was some comfort to me was the thought, the Lord will not attain final Nibbana until he has made some statement about the Sangha of monks. And the Buddha said, But Ananda, what does the Sangha of monks <coughs> expect of me? I have, <coughs> I have taught the Dhamma, Ananda, making no inner and outer. The Tathagata has no teacher's fist in respect of Dhamma. If there is anyone who thinks I shall take charge of the Sangha, or the Sangha should refer to me, let him make some statement about the Sangha. But the Tathagata does not think in such terms, so why should the Tathagata make a statement about the Sangha? Ananda, I am now old, worn out, venerable, one who has traversed life's path. I have reached the term of life, which is 80, just as an old cart is made to go by being held together with straps. So the Tathagata's body is kept going by being strapped up. It is only when the Tathagata withdraws his attention from outward signs and by the cessation of certain feelings enters into the signless concentration of mind that his body knows comfort. Therefore, Ananda, you should live as islands unto yourselves, being your own refuge, with no one else as your refuge. With the Dhamma as an island, with the Dhamma as your refuge, with no other refuge. And how does a monk live as an island unto himself, with no other refuge? Here, Ananda, a monk abides contemplating the body in the body, earnestly, clearly aware, mindful, and having put away all hankering and fretting for the world. And likewise with regard to feelings, mind, and dhamma. That, Ananda, is how a monk lives as an island unto himself, with no other refuge. And those who now, in my time or afterwards, live thus, they will become the highest, if they are desirous of learning. Stop here for a moment. <clears throat> this part is quite important. You see, the Buddha says, eh, I have taught the Dhamma, Ananda, making no inner and outer. The Tathagata has no teacher's fist in respect of Dhamma. So here he's saying eh, there's no inner and outer circle of disciples. Eh? Just like... Uh, uh, like when you compare with the uh, Chinese tradition, uh, they they have uh, uh, what they say, Lai Sun Gua Sun, Roi Xin, Roi Xin, inner grandchildren and outer grandchildren. Uh, the inner one is closer to them, uh, uh, namely the son's children. Uh, 
what the daughter's children are considered outer. Uh, so there's a discrimination uh, for the Chinese uh, regarding the male and the female. But here the Buddha says uh, there, there is no inner and outer circle of uh, disciples. Uh, also, there is no teacher's fist uh, in respect of Dhamma. In other words, he does not hold back something like, in his fist. Like, uh, but in the Mahayana teachings, uh, they contradict this. Like. They say that uh, the Buddha uh, did not teach the Mahayana Dhamma to his disciples, uh, to his Savaka disciples, because uh, they were, didn't have the wisdom uh, to understand the Mahayana teaching. So the Buddha, they claim, uh, the Buddha hid the Mahayana teachings in the ocean. And then uh, after 500 years, our uh, this uh, Long Supusa, his Pali name is Nagajuna. Uh, he claimed uh, he went to the Dragon Palace uh, underneath the sea uh, and took out all the Mahayana Sutras. Uh. But there's no such thing, uh, the Buddha says. Uh, he does not uh, hold back some of his teachings and he does not discriminate uh, uh, inner and outer circle of disciples. Uh. So why would he uh, not want to teach uh, Mahayana teachings? Uh, if it was the Buddha's teachings, he would have taught his disciples then. then uh, <clears throat> also, you see where the Buddha is 80 years old and uh, has come to uh, life's end. Uh, uh, the Buddha, every now and then, uh, he feels uh, discomfort and, and pain. So he has to go into the signless concentration. Uh, then only uh, he knows some comfort. So, uh, this last part, uh, in some other suttas, they translate it as, uh, be, an, be a lamb unto yourself. Be a refuge unto yourself in no other refuge. Take the Dhamma as your lamp. Take the Dhamma as your refuge with no other refuge. So here basically the Buddha is saying, rely on yourself and rely on Dhamma. Only these two. Not like nowadays, a lot of people, they don't study the Buddha's words. They don't know that there's so much the Buddha has said. The Buddha says his teachings are complete, perfect and complete. There's no need to add to his words. So, but nowadays a lot of monks go all over the world looking for a famous teacher. If the teacher can guide you to the Buddha's original words, then you should take heed. If he teaches his own Dhamma, then you don't need to take heed. Uh, uh, any monk uh, who teaches uh, should only teach the Buddha's Dhamma, not his own Dhamma, not his own views. Uh. Okay, then the Lord, rising early, dressed, took his robe and bowl and entered Vesali for alms, having eaten on his re having eaten on his return from the alms round, he said to the venerable Ananda, Bring a mat, Ananda, we will go to the Chapala shrine for the siesta. Very good Lord. Uh, for the rest. Uh, and getting a mat, he followed behind. Then the Lord came to the Chapala shrine and sat down on the prepared seat. Ananda saluted the Lord and sat down to one side. And the Lord said, Ananda, Vesali is delightful. The Udena shrine is delightful. The Gotamaka shrine is delightful. The Sam Satambaka shrine is delightful. The Bahuputta shrine is delightful. The Chapala shrine is delightful. Ananda, whoever has developed the four, here it says four roads to power. Huh? Other places they translate it as the four bases of psychic power. Huh? Uh, practice them frequently, made them his vehicle, made them his base, established them, become familiar with them, and properly undertaken them could undoubtedly live for a kappa, a world aeon, or the remainder of one. Here they, they translate a century, but the real Pali word is kappa, meaning an aeon, world cycle, or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers, properly undertaken them, and he could, Ananda, undoubtedly live for a kappa, or the remainder of one. But the Venerable Ananda, failing to grasp this broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Lord. Lord, may the Blessed One stay for a kappa, 
our world for aeon. May the welfare stay for aeon, for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. So much was his mind possessed by Mara. And a second time the Buddha said, and a third time the Buddha said the same thing. Then the Lord said, Ananda, go now and do what seems fitting to you. Very good Lord, said Ananda, and rising from his seat, saluted the Lord, passed by on the right and sat down under a tree some distance away. <clears throat> Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here the Buddha is telling Ananda that whoever has developed fully like, the four ED padas, the four ED pada, ED is psychic power, la, pada is path. La. The four paths or bases uh, to attain psychic power uh, and practice them frequently. Uh, if he wanted to, uh, he could live for a kappa world cycle. Uh, and he say, <coughs> the Buddha says uh, he has developed this idipada and he can do that. Uh, and uh, he, he dropped this hint uh, and Ananda did not beg him uh, to live for this world cycle. Uh, a lot of people I uh, find it uh, um, unacceptable uh, that the Buddha says uh, he could live for a world cycle. Uh, so either they modify it uh, to a uh, Ayu Kappa, which is a life aeon. Life aeon meaning uh, at that time, if people lived during the Buddha's time, uh, if the people at that time uh, generally uh, could live up to a hundred years, uh, then the Buddha was the Buddha men, uh, according to these people who interpret it, uh, that the Buddha said uh, he could live on for another 20 years uh, until he was a hundred. Uh, uh, that's one interpretation. Uh. Then here is, uh, uh, that's why it says here is a century, a uh, hundred years. Uh, uh. But instead of saying a century, if you, he, he, what they meant is actually a ayu kappa, uh, a life aeon, uh, a life uh, because the Buddha says in some other sutta, a human being's lifespan uh, can vary uh, from 80,000 years, which is the maximum, down to 10 years. Uh, that's why when I was young uh, and I studied the Bible uh, in school, uh, I remember that they said uh, the ages of some of these uh, uh, early sages like Moses and Abraham uh, or something in terms of like 25,000 years and all that. But nowadays, uh, because they, they think uh, the figure is so ridiculous, uh, they don't understand that lifespan can go so high. They have reduced all those. If you look at the modern Bibles, uh, all the ages have been reduced. Uh. <laughs> so this uh, Nanda, uh, he did not ask the Buddha to stay on. Uh, and this was one of the things uh, uh, the Arahans found fault with him la. after the Buddha passed away. Eh, they found fault with Ananda over a few things. Eh. This was one of them. La. Soon after Ananda had left, Mara, the evil one, came to the Lord, stood to one side and said, Lord, may the blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the blessed Lord's final Nibbana because the blessed Lord has said this, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till I have monks and disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of Dhamma, trained in conformity with Dhamma, correctly trained and walking the path of the Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from their teacher, teach it, declare it, establish it, expound it, analyze it, make it clear, till they have Till they shall be able by means of the Dhamma to refute false teachings that have arisen and teach the Dhamma of wondrous effect. And now, Lord, the Blessed Lord has such monks and disciples. May the Blessed Lord now attain final Nibbana. May the welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And the Blessed Lord has said, I will not take final Nibbana till I have nuns and female disciples who are accomplished, etc or till I have lay men followers who are accomplished, etc. Till I have lay women followers who are accomplished, etc. May the Blessed Lord now take final Nibbana. And the Blessed Lord has said, Evil one, I will not take final Nibbana till this holy life has been successfully established and flourishes, is widespread, well known far and wide, well proclaimed among mankind everywhere. 
and all this has come about. May the Blessed One now attain final Nibbana. May the Welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. At this, the Lord said to Mara, You need not worry, evil one. The Tathagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take final Nibbana. And so the Lord at the Chapala Shrine, mindfully and in full awareness, renounced the life principle. And when this occurred, there was a great earthquake, terrible hair raising and accompanied by thunder. And when the Lord saw this, he uttered this verse, Gross or fine, things become the sage abjured, sworn, calm, composed, he bursts, becoming shell. Stop here for a moment. So here... Uh, Mara has been pursuing the Buddha to enter, enter Nibbana many times. At one time, he, the Buddha said he will not enter Nibbana until the monks and the disciples are well trained. And then another time when the Mara uh, asked the Buddha to, ask, to enter Nibbana, the Buddha said he will not enter Nibbana until the nuns and the female disciples are accomplished and well trained, etc. Then another time when Mara came, the Buddha said he will not enter, Nib enter Nibbana until the layman followers are uh, accomplished. La. And then another time he said until the lay women followers are accomplished. La. Then another time he said he will not take enter, enter final Nibbana until the sasana, la, the Buddhist religion, la, is established and widespread, etc. So now the Buddha uh, uh, and this uh, last time uh, when Mara came to ask the Buddha to enter Nibbana, then the Buddha said, okay, la, three months time he will enter Nibbana. So this Mara keeps telling, asking the Buddha to enter Nibbana because he doesn't want the Buddha to continue teaching the Dhamma and lead uh, more, peop <coughs> more people across the, to the other shore la, to enter Nibbana and leave this... Uh, a uh, round of rebirths. Uh, so, you see, the, when the Buddha decided to enter Nibbana, he renounced the life principle. The volition, uh, the Sankara, is the. Uh, actually, this one should be uh, Ayu Sankara, the uh, will to live. Uh, will to live. Uh, so, the Buddha renounced the will to live. Uh, uh, then only uh, the Buddha can enter Nibbana. Uh, that's why uh, I say uh, in the dependent origination, uh, Sankara always refers to the will to live. Uh, if you don't uh, let go of the will to live, uh, you will still live on. Uh, and the Venerable Ananda thought, it is marvelous, it is wonderful how this great earthquake arises, this terrible earthquake, so dreadful and hair-raising, accompanied by thunder. Whatever can have caused it, he went to the Lord, saluted him, sat down to one side and asked him that question. And the Buddha said, Ananda, there are eight reasons, eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. This great earth is established on water, the water on the wind, the wind on space. And when a mighty wind blows, this stirs up the water and through the stirring up of the water, the earth quakes. That is the first reason. In the second place, there is an ascetic or Brahmin who has developed psychic powers or a mighty and powerful Deva whose earth consciousness is weakly developed and his water consciousness is immeasurable and he makes the earth shudder and quake and violently quake. That is the second reason. Again, when a Bodhisattva descends from the Tusita heaven, mindful and clearly aware into his mother's womb, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the third reason. Again, when the Bodhisattva emerges from his mother's womb, mindful and clearly aware, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the fourth reason. Again, when the Tathagata gains unsurpassed enlightenment, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the fifth reason. Again, when the Tathagata sets in motion the wheel of the Dhamma, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the sixth reason. Again, when the Tathagata, mindful and clearly aware, renounces the um, uh, will to live, 
Then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. Again, when the Tathagata gains a Nibbana element without remainder, then the earth shudders and shakes and violently quakes. This is the eight reasons. These, Ananda, are the eight reasons, the eight causes for the appearance of a great earthquake. So these are... You see the first one the Buddha says, uh, the earth is established on water, water on wind, wind on space. Uh, this one people will find it a bit hard to uh, to see. La. But it reminds me la, because uh, our water source uh, is up on the hill, la, very high up, a few hundred feet high. Yeah. And the water comes out from the ground, uh, comes out from the ground. and. Uh, Surprisingly, eh, even though this water trickles out from the, from the ground, eh, you have small fish coming out and small crabs and small prawns coming out from the ground, up in the mountain, up in the hill. So evidently, eh, uh, this water eh, comes from a source eh, underneath. Eh, and this underneath, eh, there must be a lot of water to have uh, prawns and crabs and uh, fish and all that eh, come out. Eh. So it reminds me because the Buddha says here, the Buddha here says uh, that the earth uh, is established on water. Uh, the water is below the earth. Uh, so layer, probably a layer down there. Uh. Ananda, these eight kinds of uh, there are these eight kinds of assemblies. What are they? They are the assembly of Katyas or noble, uh, the warrior clan. Assembly of Brahmins. Assembly of householders. Assembly of ascetics, assembly of devas of the realm of the four great kings, assembly of the 33 gods, assembly of maras, assembly of brahmas. Remember well, Ananda, many hundreds of assemblies of katiyas that I have attended. And before I sat down with them, spoke to them or joined in their conversation, I adopted their appearance and speech, whatever it might be. And I instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted them with a discourse on Dhamma. And as I spoke with them, they did not know me and wondered, who is it that speaks like this, a deva or a man? And having thus instructed them, I disappeared, and still they did not know. He who has just disappeared, was he a deva or a man? I remember well many hundreds of assemblies of Brahmins, of householders, of ascetics, of devas of the realm of the four great kings, of the 33 gods, of Maras, of Brahmas. And uh, the same thing happened. Uh, the Buddha uh, joined them in their conversation and taught them the Dhamma. And still they did not know. He who has just disappeared, was he a deva or a man? Those Ananda, the eight assemblies. Ananda, there are eight stages of mastery. What are they? Perceiving forms internally. Once one sees external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the first stage. Perceiving forms internally. One sees external forms, unlimited and beautiful or ugly, etc. That is the second stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, limited and beautiful or ugly, etc. This is the third stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms, unlimited and beautiful or ugly. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the fourth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are blue, a blue color of blue luster. Just as a flax flower, which is blue, a blue color of blue luster, or a banaris cloth, smooth on both sides, that is blue. So one perceives external forms that are blue. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the fifth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are yellow. Just as a kanikara flower, which is yellow, or a banaris cloth, which is yellow. So one perceives external forms that are yellow. This is the sixth stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are red, just as a hibiscus flower which is red, or a banaras cloth which is red. So one perceives external forms that are red. This is the seventh stage. Not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are white, of white color, of white luster, just as the morning star or sadi is white, 
or a Banaras cloth smooth on both sides that is white. So not perceiving forms internally, one sees external forms that are white. And in mastering these, one is aware that one knows and sees them. This is the eighth stage of mastery. Stop here for a moment. Uh. These four colors mentioned here uh, are part of the kasinas. Uh. If you meditate on colors, uh, these are the four colors. Uh, white, red, yellow, blue. Uh. There are ananda, these eight liberations, what are they? Possessing form, one sees forms, this is the first. Not perceiving material forms in oneself, one sees them outside, this is the second. Thinking it is beautiful, one becomes intent on it, this is the third. By completely transcending all perception of matter, thinking space is infinite, one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite space, that is the fourth. By transcending the sphere of infinite space, thinking consciousness is infinite. One enters and abides in the sphere of infinite consciousness. That is the fifth. By transcending the sphere of infinite consciousness, thinking there is no thing, one enters and abides in the sphere of nothingness. This is the sixth. By transcending the sphere of nothingness, one reaches and abides in the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. That is the seventh. By transcending the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, one enters and bites in the cessation of perception and feeling. That is the eighth liberation. Uh, stop here for a moment. This one, uh, the eight liberations, we went through them uh, in the previous sutta, number 15. Uh. Ananda, once I was staying at Uruvela on the bank of the river Naranjara under the goat herd's banyan tree, when I had just attained supreme enlightenment, and Mara, the evil one, came to me, stood to one side and said, May the Blessed One now attain final Nibbana. May the Welfarer now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. At this I said to Mara, Evil One, I will not take final Nibbana till I have monks and disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, etc. Uh, till I have nuns, lay men followers, lay women followers who will teach the Dhamma of wondrous effect. I will not take final Nibbana till this holy life has been firmly established and flourishes, is widespread, well known, far and wide, well proclaimed among mankind everywhere. And just now today, Ananda, at the Chapala shrine, Mara came to me, stood to one side and said, Lord, may the Blessed One now attain final Nibbana. Now is the time for the Lord, Blessed Lord's final Nibbana. And I said, you need not worry, evil one. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take final Nibbana. So now today, Ananda, at the Chapala shrine, the Tathagata has mindfully and in full awareness renounced the will to live. At this, the Venerable Ananda said, Lord, may the Blessed One stay for a Kappa or Aeon. May the welfarer stay for an Aeon for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. And the Buddha said, Enough, Ananda. Do not beg the Tathagata. It is not the right time for that. And a second time and a third time, the Venerable Ananda made the same request. And the Buddha said, Ananda, have you faith, have, have you faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment? Yes, Lord. Then why do you bother the Tathagata with your request up to three times? But Lord, I have heard from the Lord's own lips, I have understood from the Lord's own lips, whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power could undoubtedly live for an aeon or for the remainder of one. And the Buddha said, Have you faith, Ananda? Yes, Lord. Then, Ananda, yours is the fault, yours is the failure, that having been given such a broad hint, such a clear sign by the Tathagata, you did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for an aeon. If, Ananda, you had begged him, the Tathagata would twice have refused you, but the third time he would have consented. Therefore, Ananda, yours is the fault, yours is the failure. One Sananda, I was staying at Rajagaha, at the Vulture's Peak, and there I said, Ananda, Rajagaha is delightful, the Vulture's Peak is delightful. Whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power could undoubtedly live for us for an aeon. But you, Ananda, in spite of such a broad hint, did not understand and did not beg the Tathagata to stay for a century. Once I was staying at Rajagaha in the Banyan Park, at Robert's Cliff, at the Satapani Cave on the side of Mount Vibhara, at the Black Slope, 
at the black rock on the slope of Mount Isigili, at the slope by the snake's pool in cool wood, at the Tapoda Park, at the squirrel's feeding ground in Veluvana, in Jivaka's mango grove, and also at Rajagaha in the Mad Madakuchi Deer Park. At all these places, I said to you, Ananda, this place is delightful, etc. Whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power could undoubtedly live for an aeon. Once I was at Vesali in the Udena Shrine. Once I was at Vesali in the Gotamaka Shrine, at the Satambaka Shrine, at the Bahuputta Shrine, at the Sar Sarandada Shrine. And now today at the Chapala Shrine, I said, these places are delightful, Ananda. Whoever has developed the four bases of psychic power would undoubtedly live for an aeon or the remainder of one. The Tathagata has developed these powers and he could, Ananda, undoubtedly live for an aeon or the remainder of one. But you, Ananda, failing to grasp this broad hint, this clear sign, did not beg the Tathagata to stay for an aeon. If, Ananda, you had begged him, the Tathagata would twice have refused you, but the third time he would have consented. Ananda, have I not told you before, all those things that are dear and pleasant to us must suffer change, separation and alteration. How could this be possible? Whatever is born, become compounded, is liable to decay. That it should not decay is impossible. And that has been renounced, given up, rejected, abandoned, forsaken. The Tathagata has renounced the will to live. The Tathagata has said once and for all, the Tathagata's final passing will not, will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take final Nibbana. That the Tathagata should withdraw such a declaration in order to live on is not possible. Come now, Ananda, we will go to the Gable Hall in the Great Forest. Very good, Lord. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, Venerable Ananda appealed to the Buddha to stay on for an aeon. Huh? But it was too late. Huh? He already told Mara huh? that three months from now, huh? he will enter Nibbana. And the Lord went with the Venerable Ananda to the Gable Hall in the Great Forest. When he got there, he said, Ananda, Go and gather together all the monks living in the vicinity of Vesali and get them to come to the assembly hall. Very good Lord, said Ananda, and he did so. He then returned to the Lord, saluted him, stood to one side and said, Lord, the order of the Sangha of monks is gathered together. Now is the time for the Lord to do as he wishes. Then the Lord entered the assembly hall and sat down on the prepared seat. Then he said to the monks, Monks, for this reason, those matters which have, I have discovered and proclaimed should be thoroughly learned by you, practiced, developed and cultivated, so that this holy life may endure for a long time, that it may be for the benefit and happiness of the multitude, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit and happiness of devas and humans. And what are those matters? They are the four intense states of mindfulness, the four right efforts, the four bases of psychic power, the five spiritual faculties, the five powers, <coughs> the seven factors of enlightenment, the noble eightfold path. Then the Lord said to the monks, And now, monks, I declare to you, all conditioned things are of a nature to decay. Strive on untiringly. The Tathagata's final passing will not be long delayed. Three months from now, the Tathagata will take his final Nibbana. Thus the Lord spoke. The welfarer, having thus spoken, the teacher said this, Ripe I am in years, my life spans determined. Now I go from you, having made myself my refuge. Monks, be untiring, mindful, disciplined, guarding your minds with well-collected thought. He who, tireless, keeps to Dhamma and Vinaya, leaving birth behind, will put an end to war. So here the Buddha is telling his disciples uh, that the most important uh, parts of his teaching uh, are in these 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, uh, the four uh, Satipatthana, the four uh, what is it, Vayama, 
the 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 four idipada, the five uh, indriya, the five bala, the seven bojanga, and the arya atangika magala. Thirty-seven. If you add them all together, la. Mm. Then the Lord, having risen early and dressed, took his robe and bowl and went into Vesali for arms. Having returned from the arms round and eaten, he looked back at Vesali with his elephant look and said, Ananda, this is the last time the Tathagata will look upon Vesali. Now we will go to Bandagama. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord proceeded with a large company of monks to Bandagama and stayed there. And there the Lord addressed the monks, These monks, through not understanding, not penetrating, four things that I, as well as you, have for a long time fed on round the cycle of rebirths. What are the four? Through not understanding the Aryan morality, through not understanding the Aryan concentration, through not understanding the Aryan wisdom, through not understanding the Aryan liberation, I, as well as you, have for a long time fed on round the cycle of rebirths, and it is by understanding and penetrating the Aryan morality, the Aryan concentration, the Aryan wisdom, and the Aryan liberation that the craving for becoming has been cut off. The tendency towards becoming has been exhausted, and there will be no more rebirth. Thus the Lord spoke. The welfarer, having thus spoken, the teacher said this, Morality... Uh, concentration, wisdom, and final release. These glorious things Gautama came to know. The Dhamma he discerned, he taught his monks. He whose vision ended war to Nibbana is gone. Stop here for a moment. This uh, Sila, Samadhi, Panya, moral conduct, concentration. Mm. Mm. Saying this, uh, sila, samadhi, and panya, uh, moral conduct, concentration, and wisdom, uh, uh, basically means a noble eightfold path. Uh, the eight factors of the no noble eightfold path uh, can be also divided into three factors, uh, and the last one is liberation. Uh, liberation. Uh, then the Lord, while staying at Bandagama, delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is. Morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. Concentration, when imbued with morality, brings great fruit and profit. Wisdom, when imbued with concentration, brings great fruit and profit. The mind imbued with wisdom becomes completely free from the asavas, that is, from the asava of sensuality, of becoming, of wrong views and of ignorance. And when the Lord had stayed at Bandagama for as long as he wished, he said, Ananda, let us go to Hatigama, and then to Ambagama, and then to Jambugama, giving the same discourse at each place. Then he said, Ananda, let us go to Bogana Gara. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Boganara, Boganagara. At Boganagara, the Lord stayed at the Ananda shrine. And here he said to the monks, Monks, I will teach you four criteria. Listen, pay close attention, and I will speak. Yes, Lord, replied the monks. Suppose a monk were to say, Friends, I heard and received this from the Lord's own lips. This is Dhamma, this is Vinaya, this is the Master's teaching. Then, monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words. Then, without approving or disapproving, his words and expressions should be carefully noted and compared with the suttas and reviewed in the light of the Vinaya. If they, on such comparison and review, are found not to conform to the suttas or the vinaya, the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is not the word of the Buddha. It has been wrongly understood by this monk, and the matter is to be rejected. But where, on such comparison and review, they are found to conform to the suttas or the vinaya, the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is the word of the Buddha. It has been rightly understood by this monk. 
this is the first criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there is a community of elders, teras, uh, and distinguished teachers. I have heard and received this from that community. Then, monks, you should neither approve nor disapprove his words, but compare it with the Sutta and Vinaya. This is the second criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there are many elders who are learned, bearers of the tradition, who know the Dhamma, the Vinaya, the code of rules, etc. Then their word is not to be accepted or rejected, uh, but compared to the suttas and the vinaya. This is the third criterion. Suppose a monk were to say, in such and such a place, there is one elder, Tera, who is learned. I have heard and received this from that elder. But where on such, co his words uh, should not be accepted or rejected, but compared to the sutta and vinaya where on such comparison and review they are found to conform to the suttas and vinaya, then the conclusion must be, assuredly, this is the word of the Buddha. It has been rightly understood by this monk. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here, the, this is a very important part. Huh? The Buddha says, huh? if any monk huh, claims huh, that the Buddha taught this and the Buddha taught that, huh, you should not accept, you should not reject, uh, but you must compare it with the suttas and the vinaya. Uh, you see here uh, the Buddha uh, in the first part, uh, the, the 4.8. Suppose a monk were to say, Friends, I have heard and received this from the Lord's own lips. This is Dhamma, this is vinaya, this is the Master's teaching. Uh, you find in the suttas uh, and in the Vinaya books, uh, whenever the Buddha refers to his words, uh, he always says sutta and uh, dhamma and vinaya. Dhamma and vinaya. Uh, and uh, later books, uh, they added a third one, uh, which is abhidhamma. That's why the word tripitaka came into use. Uh. The Buddha never used the word tripitaka or tipitaka. The Buddha doesn't even know this word. Uh. It was coined by later monks. Uh. Uh, so in the suttas and the vinaya, we always find that uh, the Buddha says, uh, Buddha's teaching uh, is Dhamma Vinaya. And here you can see very clearly, uh, Dhamma refers to the suttas. Uh. Vinaya is the monastic discipline uh, meant for monks and nuns. Uh. So for lay people, uh, your only teacher uh, is the suttas. This is very clear. And this part is also found in the Anguttara Nikaya, Sutta 4.8. 180, uh, uh, there also the same thing uh, is said. Uh, uh, so always remember, uh, any monk teach anything, uh, you must always compare it with the suttas. Uh, and if you are a monk or nun, uh, you can compare it with the vinaya also. Uh, if it does not conform to the suttas and the vinaya, then uh, it is not the Buddha's words. Uh, so when you use this criterion, you find, uh, for example, uh, the Abhidhamma. There are many things in the Abhidhamma that contradict the suttas. Uh, so from there, uh, we know it is not the Buddha's words. Uh, similarly with other later books, uh, for example, Visuddhi Maga. Although Visuddhi Maga is quite a good book, uh, but uh, unfortunately uh, there are certain things in Visuddhi Maga which contradict the Buddha's words. Uh, one of them is, for example, uh, in the suttas, the Buddha says, if you practice mindfulness of breathing, uh, anapanasati, you can attain all the four rupa jhanas and all the four arupas or arupa jhanas uh, plus the cessation of perception and feeling. Uh, uh, all the states of samadhi uh, uh, can be attained uh, just by practicing anapanasati. But in the Visuddhi Maga, it says uh, that if you practice anapanasati, uh, the most you can get four rupa jhanas. Uh, so there are other, many other contradictions. Uh, for example, in the uh, Abhidhamma, uh, the, uh, they talk about uh, uh, this uh, uh, six destinations, uh, this uh, uh, six destinations of rebirth, whereas the Buddha talked about five destinations of rebirth. Five destinations of rebirth are heaven, uh, the human realm, and the three woeful planes, ghost, animal, and hell realm. And then the Abhidhamma added, uh, uh, the Asura realm uh, under 
the woeful planes lah, just like the later Mahayana books did lah, the Mahayana books lah. So you can know from this lah, that the Abhidhamma arose around the same time as the Mahayana books lah, which is uh, 500 years after the Buddha's passing on. Uh, so always remember, I must compare with the suttas and the Vinaya. Then the Lord, while staying at Boga, Boga Nagara, delivered a comprehensive discourse. This is morality, this is concentration, this is wisdom. And when the Lord had stayed at Boga Nagara for as long as he wished, he said, Ananda, let us go to Pava. Very good Lord, said Ananda. And the Lord went with a large company of monks to Pava, where he stayed at the mango grove of Chunda the smith. And Chunda heard that the Lord had arrived at Pava and was staying at his mango grove. Then he went to the Lord. Uh, saluted him and sat down to one side. And the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted him with the talk on Dhamma. Then Chunda said, May the Lord accept a meal from me tomorrow with the Sangha of monks. And the Lord consented by his silence. And Chunda, understanding his consent, rose from his seat, saluted the Lord and passing by to the right, departed. And as the night was ending, Chunda had a fine meal of hard and soft food prepared with an abundance of pig's delight. And when it was ready, he reported to the Lord, Lord, the meal is ready. Then the Lord, having dressed in the morning, took his robe and bowl and went with his Sangha of monks to Chunda's dwelling, where he sat down on the prepared seat and said, Serve the pig's delight that has been prepared to, for me, and serve the remaining hard and soft food to the Sangha of monks. Very good Lord said to Chunda and did so. Then the Lord said to Chunda, Whatever is left over of the pig's delight, <coughs> you should bury in the pit. Because, Chunda, I can see none in this world with his devas, maras and brahmas, in this generation with his ascetics and brahmins, its princes and people, who, if they were to eat it, who could thoroughly digest it, except the Tathagata. Very good Lord, said Chunda, and having buried the remains of the pig's delight in the pit, he came to the Lord, saluted him, and sat down to one side. Then the Lord, having instructed, inspired, fired, and delighted him with the talk on Dhamma, rose from his seat and departed. And after having eaten the meal provided by Chunda, the Lord was attacked by a severe sickness with bloody diarrhea and with sharp pains as if he were about to die. But he endured all this mindfully and clearly aware and without complaint. Then the Lord said, Ananda, let us go to Kusinara. Very good Lord, said Ananda. Having eaten Chunda's meal, this I've heard, he suffered a grave illness, painful, deathly, from eating a meal of pig's delight. Grave sickness assailed the teacher. Having purged, the Lord then said, Now I'll go to Kusinara's town. Stop here for a moment. This uh, pig's delight, huh? Uh, here is translated uh, as according to the Pali, la, pig's delight. But then uh, the Mahayanis, uh, uh, they could not accept uh, that the Buddha ate meat. Uh, so they gave a, wrong, a different uh, translation uh, that it was something to do with some vegetarian food, la, mushroom, something. Uh. So here... Uh, the Buddha knew that after this meal, he was going to pass away. And this meal is a very special meal. So the Buddha said, nobody else can digest this meat. Because actually, for somebody to offer later, the Buddha will say, for somebody to offer the last meal to the Buddha is as meritorious as the person who offers uh, the meal to the Buddha just before enlightenment uh, is a highly meritorious uh, offering. Uh, so nobody else uh, uh, had the merit to receive this. Uh, so the Buddha asked him to bear it. Uh. Then turning aside from the road, the Lord went to the foot of a tree and said, Come Ananda, fold a robe in four for me. I am tired and want to sit down. Very good Lord, said Ananda, and did so. The Lord sat down on the prepared seat and said, Nanda, bring me some water. I am thirsty and want to drink. Nanda said, Lord, 500 carts have passed this way. The water is churned up by the wheels and is not good. It is dirty and disturbed. But Lord, the river, Kak the river Kakuta nearby has clean water, pleasant, cool, pure, with beautiful banks, delightful. 
There the Lord shall drink the water and cool his limbs. A second time the Lord said, Ananda, bring me some water. I am thirsty and want to drink. Ananda replied as before. Third time the Lord said, Ananda, bring me some water. I am thirsty and want to drink. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. And taking his bowl, he went to the stream. And that stream, whose water had been churned up by the wheels and was not good, dirty and disturbed, as Ananda approached it, began to flow pure, bright and unsullied. And the verbal Ananda thought, Wonderful, marvellous are the Tathagata's great and mighty powers. This water was churned up by the wheels and was dirty. And at my approach, it flows pure, bright and unsullied. He took water in his bowl, brought it to the Lord and told him of his thoughts, saying, May the Lord drink the water, may the welfarer drink. And the Lord drank the water. Stop here for a moment. B and the devas work. They made the water clean. The dirty water clean. At that moment, Pukusa, the Mala, a pupil of Alara Kalama, was going along the main road from Kusinara to Bava. Seeing the Lord sitting under a tree, he went over, saluted him and sat down to one side. Then he said, It is wonderful, Lord. It is marvelous how calm these wanderers are. Once, Lord, Alara Kalama was going along the main road, and turning aside, he went and sat down under a nearby tree to take his siesta. And five hundred carts went rumbling by very close to him. A man who was walking along behind them came to Alara Kalama and said, Lord, did you not see five hundred carts go by? And he said, No, friend, I did not. But didn't you hear them, Lord? And he said, No, friend, I did not. Well, were you asleep, Lord? And he said, No, friend, I was not asleep. Then, Lord, were you conscious? And he said, Yes, friend. So, Lord, being conscious and awake, you neither saw nor heard 500 carts passing by close to you, even though your outer robe was bespattered with dust. And he said, That is so, friend. And that man thought, It is wonderful, it is marvelous. These wanderers are so calm that though conscious and awake, a man neither saw nor heard five hundred carts passing close by him, and he went away praising Alara Kalama's lofty powers. And the Buddha said, Well, Pukusa, what do you think? What do you consider is more difficult to do or attain to, while conscious and awake not to see or hear five hundred carts passing nearby, or while conscious and awake not to see or hear anything when the raid Rain God streams and splashes, when lightning flashes and thunder crashes. And he said, Lord, how can one compare not seeing or hearing 500 cards with that? Or even six, seven, eight, nine, or ten hundred or hundreds of thousands of cards to that. To see or hear nothing when such a storm rages is more difficult. And the Buddha said, once Pukusa, when I was staying at Atuma at the stretching floor, the rain god streamed and splashed, lightning flashed and thunder crashed, and two farmers, brothers, and four oxen were killed. And a lot of people went out of Atuma to where the two brothers and the four oxen were killed. And Pukusa, I had at that time gone out of the door of the threshing floor and was walking up and down outside. And a man from the crowd came to me, saluted me and stood to one side, and I said to him, Friend, why are all these people gathered here? And he said, Lord, there has been a great storm, and two farmers, brothers, and four oxen have been killed. But you, Lord, where have you been? And the Buddha said, I have been right here, friend. But what did you see, Lord? And the Buddha said, I saw nothing, friend. Or what did you hear, Lord? The Buddha said, I heard nothing, friend. Were you sleeping, Lord? The Buddha said, I was not sleeping, friend. Then, Lord, were you conscious? And the Buddha said, Yes, friend. So, Lord, being conscious and awake, you neither saw nor heard the great rainfall and floods and the thunder and the lightning. And the Buddha said, That is so, friend. And Pukusa, that man, thought, It is wonderful, it is marvelous. These wonders are so calm that they neither see nor hear when the rain got streams and splashes, lightning flashes and thunder crashes. 
proclaiming my lofty powers, he saluted me, passed by to the right and departed. At this, Pukusa the Mala said, Lord, I reject the lofty powers of Alara Kalama as if they were blown away by a mighty wind or carried off by a swift stream or river. Excellent Lord, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up what had been knocked down or to point out the way to one who had got lost or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so the blessed Lord has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. And I, Lord, go for refuge to the blessed Lord, the Dhamma and the Sangha. May the blessed Lord accept me from this day forth as a lay follower as long as life shall last. Then Pukusa said to one man, Go and fetch me two fine sets of robes of cloth of gold, burnished and ready to wear. Yes, Lord, the man replied, and did so. And Pukusa offered the robes to the Lord, saying, Here, Lord, are two fine sets of robes of cloth of gold. May the blessed Lord be graciously pleased to accept them. Well then, Pukusa, the Buddha said, Clothe me in one set and Ananda in the other. Very good, Lord, said Pukusa, and did so. Then the Lord instructed, inspired, fired and delighted Pukusa the Mala with a talk on Dhamma. Then Pukusa rose from his seat, saluted the Lord, passed by to the right and departed. Stop here for a moment. So here the Buddha is saying that he was in Samadhi and there was lightning and thunder and all that. The trees came crashing down and two people died and four oxen died and the Buddha didn't hear a single sound. Uh, so, it was in very deep samadhi. Na. And this last part, na, where this Pukusa offered this uh, set of robes, uh, cloth of gold, uh, this, uh, and the Buddha accepted. Na. We find na, when the Buddha was younger, uh, he was very uh, uh, ascetic. Na. Uh, he practiced the austerities. Na. When he was younger, he probably would not accept this uh, set of uh, robes uh, with cloth of gold but now he was old already uh, then uh, he accepted it uh, and even asked Bukusa to offer the other to Ananda so this is uh, um, quite normal uh, for monks uh, when we are young uh, monks are young uh, we are very inspired uh, to practice and to be very strict uh, sometimes go overboard also uh, with the strictness eh? and uh, later as we mellow eh? then we, uh, we 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 mellow eh? we we know eh? what is important what is not important eh? soon after pukusa had gone actually this buddha he accepts these robes eh? not because he wants to use them but out of compassion eh? for pukusa so that he can get the merit eh? Probably after Pukusa has left, uh, he probably put the rope one side or give to somebody else. Soon after Pukusa had gone, Ananda, having arranged one set of the golden robes on the body of the Lord, observed that against the Lord's body it appeared dull. And he said, It is wonderful, Lord. It is marvelous how clear and bright the Lord's skin appears. It looks even brighter than the golden robes in, with, in which it is clothed. And the Buddha said, just so, Ananda, there are two occasions on which the Tathagata's skin appears especially clear and bright. Which are they? One is the night in which the, the Tathagata gains supreme enlightenment. The other is the night when he attains the Nibbana element without remainder at his final passing. On these two occasions, the Tathagata's skin appears especially clear and bright. Tonight, Ananda, in the last watch, in the sal grove of the malas near Kusinara, between two sal trees, the Tathagata's final passing will take place. And now, Ananda, let us go to the river Kakuta. Very good, Lord, said Ananda. Two golden robes were Pakusa's offering. Brighter shone the teacher's body than its dress. Stop here for a moment. Uh, here the Buddha says uh, there are two times uh, when the Buddha's skin uh, is specially clear and bright. Uh, one is on the night of enlightenment, the other is uh, when is uh, when he's passing away la, on the night of his passing away. La. In some other sutta, we had read uh, that uh, when the Buddha was old, uh, 
uh, remember Ananda observed uh, that the Buddha looked old and his skin was wrinkled and uh, uh, he did not have the brightness uh, that he used to have uh, but now that he's entering Nibbana this uh, brightness comes back again it's very different uh, with uh, certain monks uh, certain monks uh, uh, I've heard uh, when they are younger they are very good samadhi and some some people say they even have uh, psychic powers and all that. Nah. But some of them, uh, when they are old, nah, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, it seems uh, they even uh, lose their memory. Nah. Uh, not the Buddha. Nah. Buddha, When the Buddha was very old, nah, the Buddha said, nah, you can uh, question, nah, even the, the Buddha was, was about 80 years old, nah, the Buddha said, nah, his body has deteriorated, deteriorated, but don't think that his mind has deteriorated. The Buddha said, uh, you can uh, continue to ask him questions for another hundred years, uh, and he can still uh, answer everything clearly. Uh, so here the Buddha said, in the last watch, meaning from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., uh, every night is divided into three watches. Uh, the first watch, uh, Chu Fen Ye in Chinese uh, is 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Uh, the middle watch is 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, the last watch is 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, then the Lord went with a large number of monks to the river Kakuta. He entered the water, bathed and drank, and emerging went to the mango grove, where he said to the Venerable Chundaka, Come Chundaka, Fold a robe in four for me. I am tired and want to lie down. Very good, Lord, said Chundaka, and did so. Then the Lord adopted the lion posture, lying on his right side, placing one foot on the other, mindfully and with clear awareness, bearing in mind the time of awakening. And the Venerable Chundaka sat down in front of the Lord. The Buddha, having gone to Kakuta, the river, with its clear, bright and pleasant waters, Therein the teacher plunged his weary body, Tathagata, without an equal in the world, surrounded by the monks whose head he was, the teacher and lord, preserver of Dhamma, to the mango grove the great sage went, and to Chundaka the monk he said, On a fourfold robe I'll lie down, and thus adjured by the great adept, Chundaka placed the fourfold robe. The teacher laid his weary limbs to rest, while Chundaka kept watch beside him. Then the Lord said to the Venerable Ananda, It might happen, Ananda, that Chunda the smith would feel remorse, thinking, It is your fault, friend Chunda. It is by your misdeed that the Tathagata gained final Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. But Chunda's remorse should be expelled in this way. That is your merit, Chunda. That is your great deed. It is your good deed that the Tathagata gained final Nibbana after taking his last meal from you. For friend Chunda, I have heard and understood from the Lord's own lips that these two alms, alms givings are of very great fruit, of very great result, more fruitful and advantageous than any other. Which two? The one the one is the alms giving after eating which the Tathagata attains supreme enlightenment, the other that after which he attains the Nibbana element without remainder at his final passing. These two alms givings are more fruitful and profitable than all others. Chunda's deed is conducive to long life, to good looks, to happiness, to fame, to heaven and to lordship. In this way, Ananda, Chunda's remorse is to be expelled. Then the Lord, having settled this matter, at that time uttered this verse. <laughs> by giving, merit grows. By restraint, hatred's checked. He who is skilled abandons evil things. As greed, hate, and folly wane, Nibbana's gain. So here, um, the Buddha told remember, Ananda to inform Chunda that he should not blame himself for offering the food nah, that caused the Buddha to pass on. Nah. The Buddha said nah, that uh, it is actually very meritorious. Nah. Mm. So I'll stop here for tonight. Nah. Anything to discuss? Okay. Uh, so the Buddha said that uh, the Buddha said that the Buddha said that the Buddha said 
before the Buddha's Nibbana, Okay, uh, during the Buddha's time, uh, the suttas were transmitted uh, from uh, teacher to disciple uh, and the monks uh, had to uh, recite the suttas uh, to firstly to memorize it themselves and secondly to pass it on. Uh. So many thousands of monks uh, knew the suttas. Uh. So uh, it was a very good way actually uh, uh, to transmit the Buddha's words because uh, then uh, you cannot uh, uh, create something new uh, because uh, it's, it's easy uh, to create a, a, a false sutra by, by writing a, a, in a book uh, some, some, some new sutra uh, and claim is the words of the Buddha but if it is transmitted by word of mouth uh, and you start to uh, teach a new sutra which the Buddha did not teach uh, you, you, and maybe you and your friends stand of you, uh, but there are thousands, tens of thousands of the Buddha's disciples uh, who know the suttas by heart. Uh. Uh. <coughs> I'm not sure how uh, reliable um, this uh, part about the earth, eight reasons for the earthquake. But sometimes in the suttas, the Buddha says certain things uh, which uh, a person, uh, a normal person, would find it hard to accept. Uh, an example is like the Buddha says, uh, if uh, humans uh, uh, are full of greed, hatred, and delusion. And because of greed, hatred, and delusion, they do a lot of evil things. And when humans do a lot of evil things, the devas get annoyed. And when the devas get annoyed, the rain gods will not allow it to rain when it's supposed to rain. And then, because the rain does not come in time, then the crops do not grow well. And then there is famine, and a lot of people die. Uh, so this, this type of explanation by the Buddha, uh, uh, a lot of normal people uh, find it hard to accept because they can't see the devas. Uh. But the uh, logic behind it is that um, because the, the world is created by our mind, if our mind is defiled, if our mind is unwholesome, then uh, the world changes changes according to karma and a lot of obstacles arise uh, but if we uh, act with a very pure mind uh, we uh, our actions are wholesome uh, and not harmful to others uh, then uh, the world changes in a way uh, that uh, makes us happy uh. even heaven and hell is created by our mind uh. This part, na, uh, you didn't read the whole thing, la. Uh, the, it's just like the monk part, la. Uh, the first, the, the Buddha said, um, I will not take final dibbana till I have monks and disciples who are accomplished, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, trained in conformity with the Dhamma, correctly trained and walking in the path of Dhamma, who will pass on what they have gained from the teacher, teach, teach it, declare it, etc. So, in the same way, the Buddha said, I will not take final Nibbana till I have nuns and female disciples who are accomplished, uh, trained, skilled, learned, knowers of the Dhamma, etc. 
Uh, because at that time uh, there were nuns, lah. but now there are no nuns, so no, you cannot use that part. No? Mm. Anyway, there is no Buddha to take Nibbana now. <laughs> Okay, shall we end here?